So one of my favorite things to do uh, is to cook for people. And it's not so much that I enjoy cooking. Um, I do, but it's not really the main point of it. What I really enjoy is sharing a meal. I enjoy having opportunities to just sit around a table, enjoy each other's company, have like good conversations. Um, you never know what people will say and just be together. To me, that's what I like to do. You know, and so I find that when you cook and you spend some time making something nice and then people enjoy it, uh, it helps them to enjoy their conversations together. I can remember when I was young, we used to go to my, my Nona's place, my grandmother's, and she would often like have big family meals around holidays. So usually it was homemade pasta. And so I always appreciated having homemade pasta to have guests over or to enjoy each other's company. And the reason why is because it takes so much time and it's, you know, it's a thoughtful process. And, and I can remember having, you know, family get togethers, uh, and they're, you know, everybody, all the, all the family, even extended family would be there and we'd enjoy each other's company and we'd have all kinds of great laughs and joy. And usually it's around Christmas or Easter, but my uncle was always kind of a wild card. I never really knew what he was going to say. And it's one of the reasons why I think he was one of my favorite relatives to spend time with, because sometimes he would say stuff and it just seemed like out of nowhere, he would say something just to get a reaction. And in some places that would be really uncomfortable or awkward because you don't know how to respond or what to do about that. But in those times, I always really enjoyed, I was younger, but I always really enjoyed spending time together. And it's kind of like that when we invite people over, when we have, maybe it's a dinner party or maybe it's even like your small group or something like that. And you have a bunch of people over, you don't really know what to expect sometimes. Sometimes it's just that you're going to think and plan and hope that it's going to be great, but you never know what somebody's going to say. You never know how things will turn out or how people will get along. And there's this one story in scripture that really embodies this for me. Uh, it has to do with Jesus, where Jesus was uh, invited over for dinner and said something kind of like, if you had said it at a dinner party, it wouldn't go over so well. But it's Jesus, so he gets put in scripture. And so in Luke's gospel, there's been some amazing things that have happened. And it gets to the point in chapter 11 where Jesus is actually where the point where he teaches them how to pray, his followers how to pray. So you hear the what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus' followers learn how to say the Our Father or Lord's Prayer. And as he's teaching this, you know, people are crowding around and learning from him and trying to gather understanding and what it means to be following God. And as it continues, he starts teaching more. He talks about how, you know, when there's a light, you don't hide it. And then after all this teaching that he's been doing, he gets invited to dinner. And it says in Luke eleven thirty-seven 37, that when Jesus had finished speaking, so he'd done all his speaking and people had been listening to him. And it's been an experiential moment where people gather around and, and hear and learn and, and they experience his wisdom. It says, when he had finished speaking, um, the Pharisee, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. So Pharisees, if you're familiar, they're individuals who held high regard to the law. So sometimes they get a really bad rap and understandably, like they, they kind of become what we call legalistic, but they're individuals who felt really strongly that the law should be held uh, in all accord and to the letter. So if the Bible said something, they followed it. And it didn't matter what it might be. And so as these Pharisees would be uh, leaders in their communities, they would often cause people to struggle because they would be telling them to follow things and they didn't know how to follow them. And uh, it was a difficult situation. So often Pharisees become people who are in conflict with Jesus. And so as they're in conflict with Jesus often, he, you don't expect them really to invite him over for dinner, but they do. So the Pharisees invite Jesus over for dinner and what their motivation is, we can't really say, we just know what the text says, but he's invited over to dinner. He's reclining at the table. It says, but the Pharisees were surprised 
in verse 38, when Jesus did not wash before the meal. So the Pharisees, these keepers of the law, would say that, you know, a key thing is that cleanliness, you know, we sometimes hear this, cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, that's nowhere in Scripture. But some people hold it to be true, to be as important as Scripture. So the Pharisees would understand that in the law, there is a teaching around how do you uh, maintain cleanliness in community. And part of that is, you know, washing before eating. And they take offense to the fact that Jesus didn't do this. And understandably, I mean, like if you came over to my place and I was making this pasta and I wasn't washing my hands before, you'd be like, well, Rob, that's kind of gross. But I did. It just was off camera. And so Jesus is faced in a situation where they're taking offense. They notice that he didn't wash his hands. So Jesus responds to them and says this. He says, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of a cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. So now then, you Pharisees, you clean the outside. So the outside looks clean, but inside, it's not so clean. Now think about it. Like if you had a clean cup, but you put sewage in it, per se, you wouldn't want to drink out of it, even though it was a clean cup. You know, so he's saying, it's not so much the outside, it's the inside. He says, you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside of the dish make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. And so Jesus takes what they are worried about, the fact that he didn't wash his hands, and he throws it around and says, Listen, you're so worried about me washing your hands, but what have your hands been doing? You have been ignoring justice. He says, you know, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. And so Jesus encounters them and challenges them on this and says, think about what you're so upset at in this moment. And he continues, says, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. So he's saying like, you know, this cleanliness thing isn't a bad thing, but you're forgetting something else. You're forgetting what you're really meant to do, and you're meant to do both. So he talks about how they give their spices, their herbs, so they're tithing is what we would call it, but they're neglecting justice. And he's not saying, well, you know, stop giving and start focusing on justice. He's saying, actually, you need to remember that you're supposed to do both. You're forgetting what you're called to do. And he says, it's woe to you. And Jesus says four woes in this passage where he's deeply concerned about the people he's having dinner with. You know, this isn't the conversation probably that they were looking for to have at dinner. Maybe they were looking for someone to say, hey, you know, Jesus, what do you think of us? And he would say, yeah, you guys are great. Like, that's maybe what he was hoping for, maybe some encouragement. But Jesus, he knows what's on their heart, what's on their mind and says, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're worried I didn't wash my hands. You guys are neglecting the poor. You're not caring for people who need to be cared for. You're not doing what you were called to do. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. He's saying, Woe to you because you care about what people think about you. Woe to you because you care about what you look like in public. You want people to think you're doing good, you're great, you're so great because you give your tithes, but you're not doing good. You're not doing what God has invited you to. It's not just that. We see this all the time, right? We see this, maybe we see it at our dinner parties, maybe we see it at the people we invite over, maybe we just see it on on the internet, on Instagram or something like that, where people post these pictures 
of their great life and all the great things they do, or they show like the great vacations they have, or they show like how they give to the poor, or they give a sandwich to somebody, but that's just a moment. It's not their real life. They're concerned about what they're showing to people, but it's not really what's on the inside. They're just showing the outside. And so Jesus has this deep concern that these Pharisees, these people who have a deep respect for the word of God are not actually following it. Do you understand? That at this dinner party, he reclines in his chair and he basically is saying, you've said this is what you do. This is what's important to you. But you're missing a big picture. And that's caring for other people. And so Jesus says, woe to you. You want to look good in front of everybody. You want to pretend like you're doing everything right, but you're not. You're missing a big part of your faith. I think sometimes our faith is like that. We focus on certain things or we've been taught maybe, maybe it's been pastors or preachers and they've been taught and they said, this is what's most important. You know, you need to make sure you believe the right things, but it's not just about believing the right things. And I think that's Jesus's message to the Pharisees. It's not just about believing the right things, but also putting into practice what you believe. So it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus and I want to follow his ways, but do we live like that? And so for the Pharisees, they're saying we believe in the law and the law is important and they want to impose that. And I don't think that's wrong, but they're neglecting key parts of it. They might be neglecting on what's most important. Then he goes on to say that, woe to you because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. Meaning that, woe to you because you're not really going to make a difference. You know, you're going to be forgotten. You're going to be forgotten because you've put so much emphasis on this one thing, but you miss out on this other piece of faith. That faith is actions and words. Faith is beliefs and practice. It's not just one or the other. The text continues and it goes on to say that uh, as they're eating, one of the experts of the law answered him. So like after he just said, you know, you're, you guys, you're like unmarked graves, one of the experts of the law. So this isn't the Pharisees. This would be someone who, you know, maybe it is the Pharisees, but it's someone who uh, knows the law so well. So like a lawyer, we would think of in our language, but it's more than that because the law is spiritual. It's not just about, you know, regulations or how, how things work. So this teacher of the law, someone, an expert in the law says, this he says, teacher saying rabbi to Jesus. Uh, and the idea of rabbi is this great place of respect and, and authority that they're giving to Jesus. And they say, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. He's saying, Jesus, when you're talking bad about them, you're making us feel bad too. Well, why would that make them feel bad? Like what would be so bad about it? You know, he didn't say, woe to you, teacher of the law. He said, woe to you Pharisees, right? And so woe, not woe to you experts, at least not yet. But as they're, as he's talking, as he's, saying these things, they say to him, hey, Jesus, this makes us feel bad. You know, stop, stop making us feel bad. You're calling us out on our stuff and we don't like it very much. Well, why? Why do they feel they're called out? Well, probably because they're living and acting just the same way. You know, they're probably just like the Pharisees 
emphasizing one over the other, either actions or beliefs or whatever. They're not seeing the wholeness of what God invites them into and how they should be behaving. And so Jesus replies, he says, and you experts of the law. So he hasn't even said anything to them yet. You know, they're just, they're just there. They should be enjoying the meal. But he says, and you experts of the law. He says, woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you, why? Well, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can't carry and you do nothing to help them. Imagine that. You're invited over to dinner. You're thinking, this is going to be nice. You know, we got some religious leaders. We got some academics, the, the experts in the law. And we got this guy, Jesus, who people are loving. It's like, why not, right? It's going to be a great dinner. Maybe there's some pita bread, goat, stuff like that. It's the kind of stuff they would eat. And they're thinking, this is going to be a nice dinner. In the midst of the dinner starts, it's really early. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are all like, well, this is going to be good. But then they notice Jesus doesn't wash his hands. And Jesus says, hey, you're so concerned about me washing my hands, you're missing the point altogether. And so he attacks the Pharisees. He doesn't really attack them in like a angry, negative way, but he, he calls them out on their stuff. He says, you know, you are so concerned about these things, but you're missing half of your scripture. You're missing half of your story. You're half of your law. And he says the same thing to the religious teachers, these, these authorities, these, uh, you know, academics who approach the scriptures and say, this is what it says. And he says, like, you guys, you know, you're loading people down with this, but you're not even offering to help them figure out how to carry it. And he continues, he says, woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve that what your ancestors did, they killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that's been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, the generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts of the law, because you've taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. That's the key thing, who were entering. Not who wanted to enter, but who were entering. You've hindered them. So he's speaking to these religious leaders and these academic types saying, hey, you've overburdened people. You're so concerned about me not washing my hands. Look at what you've done to people. You have caused them to think that they can never be right with God. You've caused them to believe that whatever they've done or whatever they'll do, they're not accepted. You've caused them to miss out on what God has for them. And you're concerned with me not washing my hands? It says, when Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. From that point, they're just more and more concerned with, we got to prove this guy wrong. Why are they so concerned with this? Well, he called them out. He said, hey, you are so concerned with the words of Scripture. You are so concerned with the words of Scripture, and that's a good thing. That's the thing about what Jesus is saying. He's actually saying, you've got half of it right, but you don't have all of it right. You've got half of it right. You've got this idea that you need to take Scripture seriously, and that's good, but your actions don't match your words. They're not integrated. We as followers of Jesus, people who share a meal with him when we celebrate communion, and people who sit at his table, who listen to him and strive to be more and more like him, we as people who follow him, 
who call him rabbi, who call him teacher, but also call him Lord and Savior. We are people who are meant to be people of the word and of action. People who follow his teaching and strive to understand it as best we can, but also people who live it out in how we treat others, how we live our faith in character and integrity. He's calling out these Pharisees and teachers a lot because they're not doing that. And he's inviting us to know what it means to do that. What would it be like if we were people who said, I follow Jesus, and because I follow Jesus, I'm going to do these good things. What would it be like if we were people who said, I follow his teachings, and so because I follow his teachings, even though there are things there might be I struggle with or to understand, I'll be faithful to it. And I'll be faithful in my demonstration in how I treat other people with love and respect that they are made in the image of God, even though I may not agree with how they behave or how they act. As Jesus shares this meal with these religious leaders and you know, academics, he calls them out on their stuff and says, you're behaving in such a way that doesn't line up with what you say you believe. What would it be like if we sat down at the table with Jesus? What would it be like if you or I, after we prepared our meal, we sat down with him and he said, would he say woe to you? Because you say you believe this, but you don't live this way? Or would he say bless you? Bless you because you've been faithful in how you've followed my teachings and you've lived it out in such a way that you demonstrate it to the people around you. Is it a woe or is it a blessing? What is Jesus going to say to you if he was to sit down at the table with you? And then if he says that to you, how would that change once you got up from that table? For the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, how it changes them is they start to go, okay, how do we prove to everybody else that Jesus isn't that good? How do we say that, you know, Jesus is a bad guy? Because... If he's saying this to us and we're going to look bad to people, then people are going to take us seriously. People aren't going to follow us. So how do we say like, hey, Jesus, Jesus isn't so good. That's how they change. How would you change? If Jesus sat down with you and said, Kyle or Susie or Sandra or whomever, you know, woe to you. You've been saying you follow me, but you don't. You don't live it out in your faith. You don't demonstrate it in how you treat people at the grocery store. You don't show that you love me when you invite people to your table because you only choose people that will make you look good. What would it look like if Jesus said that to us? What would it look like once we got up from the table? Would we say, okay, Jesus, you're right. How do I be more like you? Or would we act like the religious leaders of his day and try to go, ah, let's discredit what he says. We don't need to really love our neighbor. We don't really need to be faithful to him or to be consistent. What would it look like if you sat down at the table with Jesus, shared a meal with him, and he brought out all that stuff you've been trying to hide? And how would it change you?